So we quit last time talking about scientific notation and going back and forth between. So do remember that if you're going to go from a large number or a very small number, put it in scientific notation. Remember, you're just going to move the decimal place so that it's between one and nine in that number. And then you indicate with the exponent how many decimal places you had to move. So for this one, notice you don't see a decimal place. So remember, that means it's at the very end. So in order to make this number between 1 and 9, we're going to go to the left. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So since I had to move it 9 places, this would be 1.20568. times 10 to the ninth. Notice that I leave those zeros off. Remember, lagging zeros with no decimal place in the number are not significant. So I'm only keeping significant figures in my number. I do keep that zero because remember the no zeros in between are always significant. So same thing with this, the one, the two, and the five are significant. Measured values, the two zeros are not. So I would move this from here, one, two, three, four. And so this would be 1.25 times 10 to the fourth. Since these are numbers bigger than one, it's always gonna be a positive exponent. For this one down here, here's where your decimal place is. And so this time I gotta to go to the right to make my number between one and nine, one, two, three. So this would be 2.5896 times 10 to the minus three leave off the leading zeros. Leading zeros are never significant, so they always go away. Same with this next one down here. I've got a really small number. These two zeros are called lagging zeros after a decimal, so they are considered significant. So I need to keep all of those. So starting at the decimal, one, two, three, four, five, six. So 4.5100 times 10 to the minus six. So practice these ones. If you still feel at all hesitant, I'm going to post one more sort of follow-up um, video that will cover things like a couple more unit conversions, a couple more examples of rounding with significant figure identification, some scientific notation, and then it'll also include more balancing equations. Sort of like practice things in chapter one that maybe you've had problems with. So moving along, in math, oftentimes you think about things in terms of percent. So if you say, well, I scored 400 out of 700. So that in comparison to, well, I scored 300 out of, out of 450, those when you have numbers that are different unit scales, it's difficult to compare them side by side. But the nice thing with percent, it, it puts everything on a scale of zero to 100. So everything is zero to 100. For example, I used to have a um, teacher that I worked with and he routinely would give tests where he would sit down and write questions until he had written questions over all the material. And the questions would typically be 10 to 15 points apiece. So sometimes you would take a test and you might get a 450 out of 600. Sometimes you might take a test and it was a small test and maybe you got 175 out of 225. So when you look at those, you're like, well, how do those two compare? What is my grade when I just have those point values? So percent is how much you got divided by the maximum possible or the whole. So if we took 450 divided by 600, and then it's gonna give you a decimal. So then you multiply it times 100 in order to give you the percent score. You could do the same thing with the 175 divided by 225 times 100 is going to give you the percent score. So then you have something to more compare it to. So in the 450 divided by 600 times 100 comes out as a 75% score. 175 divided by 225 times 100 would tell you that you got a 78. So maybe you would have known or wouldn't have known how you were doing relative to the rest of the class, but this way you can figure out a percent per grade. So here's an example that you can use. We have 48 coins, 12 are quarters, 20 are nickels, 10 are dimes, and the rest are pennies. So determine the percent of each coin. So where's your total? This is the total, and then each of these are the part. So you would take 12 divided by 48 times 100 will tell you the percent of the quarters. 20 divided by 48 times 100 would tell you the percent of the nickels. And then 10 divided by 48, sorry, 
that's 48, times 100 would tell you the percent of your dimes. And then with the rest are pennies, the way to figure out how many pennies, you could take 48 and subtract the numbers of quarters, nickels, and dimes. So that would tell you if you took 48 minus 12 minus 20 minus 10, tells you that you have six pennies. So six divided by 48 times 100 would tell you the percent of your pennies. So just including that, that would solve this problem. 20 divided by 48 times 100 gives us 42. 10 divided by 48 is 21. 6 divided by 48 is the rest of them. And so I would get 12. So all of these should add up to 100. Yeah, so they should add up to 100 total because that would be the parts of the whole. So here's one in relationship to medical care. You have two infants in the perinatal ICU. One infant's weight increases from 126 ounces to 147 ounces. The other infant's weight increases from 86 to 103. So you ask yourself, okay, so one's a little bigger, one's really a lot smaller, and they both gained weight, but what is their greatest percent weight increase? So this is asking, what is, that how much of a change have they had? So a change in weight requires that you subtract. So infant number one, you take 147 minus 126, so that would be 21 ounces, would be the amount that they actually increased. You would divide that by what they weighed to begin with. So 126 ounces is what they began with. That would be like the whole times 100. The other infant went from 86 to 103. So doing the difference between them, 17 divided by the beginning, 86 times 100 is going to tell you their percent increase. So this one ends up coming out as 19.76 or 20%. This one, 21 divided by 126, ends up count, coming up with a 17% increase. So baby number two, number one, number two, baby number two actually has had a higher percent body mass increase. So when you're doing accuracy and precision, take this into account. And this is really important when you're doing measurements is to be accurate is to get the right answer. So I always think of accuracy as being really like the one shot deal. So you take a dart, you throw it at the board, you hit the bullseye, then you're done. That's accuracy. If you're precise, you're repeatable. So you really want to try and make sure that you are careful with your measurements. And over time, many tries, you end up with the same results. So this is why you can be accurate and not precise. You can be precise but not accurate. And you can have both or you can have neither. So when thinking about this, if you are accurate but not precise, that means that on that bullseye, sometimes you get the right answer, but most of the time you're sort of scattered. So this is good accuracy, but poor precision. You can be precise and hit the same part of the target all the time, but you're not in the right area. So this is high precision, but low accuracy. See the difference between them. So accuracy is really like looking at each time you hit the bullseye as an individual. If you hit it more than 50-50, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> if you are neither accurate nor precise, then that's when you're all over the place. Okay, so that would be low accuracy and low precision. And then what everybody strives to have is they strive to be able to hit the target and do it over and over and over and over again. And that would be high accuracy and high precision. So care in measurements, that really makes the difference. We will look at this a little bit in lab, reason why I wanted to cover it. So we talked about mass, we talked about the amount of 
a substance as mass. We've also talked about volume, the amount of space something takes up. So the liter is the base unit. Just as a note, when we talk about milliliters, a common volume equivalent that we use is a cubic centimeter. So one milliliter is described as being anything that is a centimeter wide, a centimeter deep, and a centimeter long. So think of sort of like a cube shape. If there's a centimeter by centimeter by centimeter cube, that is one milliliter. So you will see in dosages, you will see in concentrations, you can see milliliters and cc's and they are the same value so you can switch from one to another you don't have to do a unit conversion because they're equal so you can just substitute cc for milliliters in any type of problem but if we take mass which is variable and we take dense uh, volume which is variable and we compare the mass to the volume ratio that comes up with a measurement called density and density is actually consistent for that substance. So it doesn't matter how much of the mass you have, it is going to have a relative volume based on its density. So mass divided by volume is equal to density. Mass is typically in grams. Den volume is typically in milliliters. They talk about grams per mil in a density solution. So if a substance does not dissolve in water, if it forms a heterogeneous mixture, and it is less dense, means that it has less mass compared to its volume, then it will actually float on top of the water like a piece of wood. If the substance has more mass compared to its unit volume, then it will sink if it does not dissolve in the water. So they give wood and metals like pennies as examples. So water is a good standard to use because water has this density. One gram of water takes up a volume of one cubic centimeter or one milliliter. So we can do some calculations. And in doing this, just remember that always density equals mass divided by volume. With mass, you're looking at grams. With volumes, you're looking at milliliters. So density will be G per ml. So the unit values for those are such. So in this one, a 1.00 liter volume of sugar has a density of 1.29 grams per mil. Determine the mass of the sugar in the sample. So always think of, okay, what do I know? So I know 1.2 liter, I know V, or sorry, 1.00 liter, and I know density. So grams per mil would be the same as putting 1.29 grams over one milliliter. And so in this, notice that if I want to know the mass, I want to know the grams. So I need in this, I have grams here. I want to get my volumes to cancel, leaving my answer in grams. But in order for volumes to cancel, notice that my units are not the same. So always make sure that you check your units. Here I have 1.00 liters and I have milliliters. I can't use those two differently. So I've got to convert. So 1.00 liters is equal to how many milliliters? So these don't fit, I've got to convert them. It's Since I have liters, it's just a one-step conversion, times in a line, liters goes on the bottom, milliliters goes on top, milli gets a thousand, liters has a one. So liters and liters will cancel. So 1.00 liters times a thousand will tell me that I have a thousand milliliters. So now I have milliliters and I have density in milliliters. So in rearranging this formula, I want to find M. So D equals M over V. So remember in algebra, you can move a unit from one side of an equation to the other side just by multiplying or dividing to move both, to move the unit. So in this, if I multiply both sides times V, volume will cancel. 
And so over here, volume times density is equal to mass. So here's my volume, 1,000 milliliters, times density, which is 1.29 grams per one milliliter. Notice then, milliliters and milliliters will cancel. And my answer then, times 1,000, 1 1.29 times 1,000, is 1,290 grams. Now the last question is significant figures. So my measured values with significant figures, it is only going to take place when you're talking about a measured value. So density is considered a standard value. Like milli means a thousand, density is a standard value that you would not measure, but you would actually calculate. So you don't use significant figures when you're trying to figure out the, dense, the significant figures of my mass amount. Here is my measured value, my 1.00 liter volume. That is the measured value. And so in here, that's how I determine significant figures. So you see that there's three, because remember zeros after a decimal place are significant. So when I look at this, here's one, two, three. I have 1,290 grams, the one, the two, the nine, they are significant. The zero remains to keep the size, but it's not a significant figure. So this is the unit, it gets left as it is. Another measurement in chemistry is temperature. So chem temperature is really measuring the hotness or coldness of a substance. I think of temperature as being created by the vibrational activity of molecules. So molecules vibrate. The more they vibrate, the more energy they generate. The hotter, it's like the thermal energy that is generated. So molecules vibrate and this produces thermal energy. The more vibration, the hotter it is. The less vibration, the colder it is. In the United States, we use what's known as Fahrenheit, but everywhere else in the world, they use Celsius. And so looking at the scales together, here's really the ones that I want you to be familiar with. The fact that the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit is 212, you can see that here. In Celsius, it's 100 degrees Celsius. The freezing point of water, it's 32 degrees with Fahrenheit, zero degrees for Celsius. So you can see that Celsius so Celsius is based on the freezing point and the boiling point of water. That's how they came up with the zero and 100 scale. Fahrenheit, on the other hand, kind of like the other English units, Fahrenheit went based on an environmental temperature. So Fahrenheit is based on the hottest day in Europe, that became 100. The coldest day in Eastern Europe, that became zero. So it's much more of an environmental value. Where compared to Celsius, which is based on a characteristic of water. So they're not the exact same scale. We will talk about a scale that is used in chemistry when talking about gases, and that is called Kelvin. Kelvin is based on the absolute zero, which is the coldest temperature that water, or sorry, coldest temperature that molecules can get. It's the temperature at which they stop vibrating. We will need to use that in some of our gas law characteristics. But for this, make sure that you are familiar with these values. Body temperature, 98.6 for humans, 37 degrees Celsius. Room temperature, not necessarily in the science and technology building, but room temperature is typically considered 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 25 degrees Celsius on the Celsius scale. I'm not going to expect you to do this unit conversion, but we will work on these ones just to show you as an example if you want with this one if you know Fahrenheit and you want to go to Celsius you would use this if you want to go from Celsius to Fahrenheit you would use this so the difference it's about 1.8 is the factor plus or minus 32 
So for example, I say it's 75 degrees in my office. And so 75 minus 32 divided by 1.8 should tell me what the Celsius temperature is. So 75 minus 32 is 43. And then divide that by 1.8. And I get 23.888 repeating, so like 24 degrees Celsius. So that's why they say 75 and 25 is about the same. I'm more of a 22 degrees Celsius kind of girl. <laughs> I prefer it to be a little bit cooler. So we've talked about energy. Just as a reminder, remember it's the ability to do work. If it's stored, it's potential. If it's active, it's kinetic. That things that energy changes forms. That's what the law of conservation of matter says. We will talk a little more about calories and nutritional calories. Remember that that is energy in chemical molecules, the energy that's contained in food, and it's really chemical bonds. We'll spend quite a bit of time in chapters three and four covering that. Heat though, heat is this transfer, thermal energy transfer from a warmer body to a colder one, and how a well suited a substance is to absorb heat and change temperature is what they call specific heat. So specific heat is determined or it's sort of a standard like density. So if you look at, for example, water, the specific heat of water, and you can tell they developed a lot of these standards based on water. The specific heat of water means that water will absorb one calorie of heat energy for every gram of water and it changes one degree Celsius. So that's really what that value is talked about. So everything else is really compared to, compared to water. So notice that metals, metals do not have to absorb as much energy before they change temperature. Well, that makes sense. You put like your, your fry pan on the stove and turn it on. If it was like water, it would change temperature so slowly. You would have to heat it and heat it and heat it before you could actually cook. So instead, you want to use something that has a very low specific heat so that that heat gets transferred instead of being absorbed by the pan, it gets transferred to your food. So these things will heat up quickly. Aluminum is a good one. So aluminum, having that about 0.21, you take a nice thin aluminum foil, and so it's going to heat up quickly, transferring heat to foods, and then it also cools quickly when it's a nice thin layer. Cast iron, notice that cast iron's got a thinner specific, a smaller specific heat, which means that it transfers heat even faster. The problem is, is cast iron is so thick. If you could make iron super, super thin, it would cool off quickly like Aluminum does. Unfortunately, cast iron, you'd have it like it's about a hundred times thicker than what an aluminum foil piece is. That means it's going to have that much more energy it has to release. And that's why you grab your cast iron skillet and burn your hand because it's so heavy. So these metals in general heat up fast. These water heats up really slow because of this specific heat. And notice that the human body is closer to the, temp to the specific heat of water. That means that we absorb and release a lot of heat energy and we don't change temperature really fast. That's a good thing because this helps us to maintain our body temperature. So if we were more like metals, we would have problems of heating and cooling, heating up and cooling down way too fast to survive. All right, so states of matter we've talked about. We've talked about solids, liquids, and gases. Just make sure that you review this part about the arrangement of molecules, the energy. There's a good chart. This one kind of sums it up. We've talked about shape, volume, kinetic energy. We talked about the packing of them. But now, if you have a solid and it absorbs heat energy, it then causes the molecules to vibrate faster, vibrate faster, and eventually those molecules will want to separate apart. So they will melt. In doing this, it is called a physical change. So these are water molecules tightly packed, but these are still water molecules loosely packed. Melting, freezing, boiling, condensing, 
all examples of physical changes because the substance is the same thing. Same thing if you chopped up wood. If you chop something, it's just now in a lot of little pieces, but it's still wood. It's just like wood chips versus being in an actual log. So things that you can do to matter that create a physical change will change its appearance, but you actually could convert, so you could like glue all the wood back together and make it come back. However, chemical change is one where you chemically change the identity of the substance. And so in this, they show the charcoal briquettes. So you know that charcoal is carbon. So it's carbon that's been kind of glued together into the briquettes. When you light it, you see that you get a flame, you get heat, burning, good example of a chemical change. Rusting, chemical change. With this one, You'll notice if when you're done, the coals get smaller and smaller and smaller, and what you're left with is ash. And you can't take the ash and convert it back to the charcoal briquette. So if you can't change it back just by a physical means, by freezing it, chilling it, heating it, if you can't change it back, then it's a chemical reaction. So you've actually changed the identity of the substance. So here's what happens when you burn. Charcoal, which is carbon, when a flame is applied, it begins this reaction. So you do have to put a flame to start it. Charcoal plus oxygen, the oxygen's in the air. It reacts and it forms a product, a substance that is different than the reactants. So you would say that on this side, you have C, which is S, that means it's a solid, plus O2, which is the gas, that is the air. When they combine, they react to form CO2, which exists as a gas. So the S, the G, you might even have a little L if it was water as a liquid. You might even see it AQ, that means that it is a substance dissolved in water, also called aqueous. So if you see those, they are not elements. These are telling you the state of the substance in the reaction. Everything on this side is the reactants. Everything on this side is the products. Think of the reactants as the starting material and the products is the end result. And so the arrow is the divider. The arrow is how you say, this is what I started with and then this is what I ended with. And you can see that the compounds themselves are different. So in this, do you see that one carbon makes one carbon dioxide? Two oxygens make two carbon dioxides. So the law of conservation of matter says the total number of atoms of each type in a chemical reaction is never gained nor sort of created nor destroyed. It just changes form. So can you see how this carbon is combining with the oxygen to make carbon dioxide? And this is a gas, which is why your charcoal disappears. So the solid gets converted to a molecule that exists as a gas and then disappears over time. But now sometimes you have hydrogen, which we'll say is a gas, plus oxygen, also a gas, is going to react to form water. And water is then going to exist as a liquid. So in this reaction, so this is how you can make water, hydrogen and oxygen making water. These are your starting materials. These are your products. So here is the reaction arrow. So that's how you can split them. But notice here, two hydrogens make two hydrogens, but two oxygens can't make one oxygen. So the law of conservation of matter says, so it's not that they in, interact or react in exact molecule numbers, but they can vary in terms of the number of molecules in the reaction. So the way that you balance 
an equation is to make sure that the total number of hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules that react to form water molecules accounts for and creates a balanced number of hydrogens and oxygens. So here's how I do it. What I do is I look at the reactant side and I list the number of atoms per molecule. So H2, two hydrogens. O2, two oxygens. So that's according to the formula, two hydrogens, two oxygens. Over on the product side, H2O is two hydrogens and one oxygen. And I write oxy, you don't have to, but if I write one zero, it really looks like a 10 to me, which is why I write oxy. So when I do a comparison, reactants and product sides have to be balanced, and my hydrogens are already balanced, but I now need to balance the oxygens. So if I have two oxygens on the reactant side, I am going to have to increase the number of water molecules so I have a total of two oxygens. That is the number that goes here. They call this the coefficient. It is saying how many molecules of water would you end up making? Well, if I need this to be two, the how I can have two oxygens is I need two molecules of water. So that means that this two will double the number of hydrogens and double the number of oxygens on the product side in order to balance my oxygens. But now what I did in doing this is I changed my hydrogens. So now I have four hydrogens on the product side and only two hydrogens on the reactant side. So I have to go back and balance these before I can say that it is done. So it is always the smaller number that you're going to increase. And the number you're putting up here is how many you would multiply times the number of atoms in that formula. So H2, if I put a two here, that will double the number of hydrogens, giving me four hydrogens. But notice it doesn't do anything to this oxygen because oxygen is a different molecule in the reaction. Over here, when I put a two, I have to double the hydrogen and the oxygen. But over here, when I put a two in front of the hydrogen, it only affects the hydrogen. So when I look back, four hydrogen and four hydrogen total, two oxygen and two oxygen, which means that this is a one. That is a balanced equation. So you're gonna do with the same thing each time when balancing. And so you're adding what's known as the coefficient. And the goal is to get the total number of, of atoms of each atom type, or sorry, the total number of atoms of each element the same on both sides of the equation. So I have a balancing equations worksheet. It is the third worksheet in your exam one little handouts that I gave you. It's just underneath where unit conversions are. And so I'll run through a couple. If you need some more help, I'm going to do another video and walk through more of these as well as reviewing some of the others. But if it's something that's familiar with you, then just practice them. Make sure that you've got them. The answer keys are posted in Moodle. So first step one, draw a line. Always put a line through the arrow. Two, list the number of atoms per formula. Then you're going to balance the numbers that are not balanced. Always start with the side that has less. So in this, 1mg, 2n2. Right, one magnesium, two nitrogens. On the product side, three magnesiums, two nitrogens. Mg3 and two, three magnesiums, two nitrogens from the formula. Next one. So here, magnesiums are not balanced, but nitrogens are. So we can change the magnesium. So notice we have one on the reactant side, three on the product side. I have to increase the reactant side. So in order to have a total of three magnesiums, I need to have three atoms of magnesium. So that three goes in front. It doesn't change the nitrogen because the nitrogen is a different molecule on the reactant side. So when I look back, now they're balanced. So this is a one and this is a one. Next one, draw a line, make your list. So here, Al2, two aluminum. Now when you see parentheses, 
Remember that parentheses mean that everything inside is found times the number outside. So this means I have three carbons and I have nine oxygens. So I have to take this three and multiply it by the formula inside. Over on the other side, two AL, three oxygen. Now I have oxygen here and oxygen here. Do not list them together because this is aluminum and oxygen and then this is going to be my carbon and oxygen. List them separate because they are different molecules, but I always put a bracket so that I know that I have oxygen on in two places on one side of the reaction. The total number of oxygens have to end up balancing. So balance the simpler. And by simpler, the ones that are found in one place on either side. Do that first. Sometimes that will end up balancing the more complicated ones. So here, I look aluminum, two and two. I don't have to do anything to aluminum. The carbon, I have three carbons over here, one carbon over here. So this side has to change. I have to make this three carbons. To make it three carbons, I have to have three carbon dioxides. So that will multiply the number of carbons and its oxygen pair by three. So go back and double check. I didn't mess up aluminum. Carbons are now balanced. And now when I add my oxygens, three oxygens and six oxygens together is nine oxygens. So they're already balanced. So I actually don't have to do anything else. Like I said, balance the simpler atoms first, those that are found only in one place on either side, then go to the more complicated ones. All right, so I'm gonna run through these ones and I want you to practice. And if you run into problems or questions, please bring them to class on Wednesday. So we have a lot to try and cover on Wednesday, as much of chapter two as we can for the exam that's the following week. Next one, draw the line every time. First thing you do, draw the line. Then list your atoms. Two hydrogens, one oxygen, one nitrogen, or sorry, nitrogen, one sodium. Over here, two hydrogens, two hydrogens, one sodium, one oxygen, and one more hydrogen. Just make the link, list them separate, but make sure you link them so you remember that there's hydrogen in two places on the product side. Balancing the sodiums are one in one. Balancing the oxygens, they're one in one. So I've got to balance the hydrogens. Now here's where some of the trick comes in. So over on this side, I have two hydrogens. No matter what number I put here, I will always have an even number of hydrogens. Over here, I have an even number of hydrogens. So I know that this is going to have to be an even number so that this odd number of hydrogens becomes even and I can balance it. So in this one, I need to make my hydrogens even. So if I put a two here, that will make times two, times two, times two. That will give me two sodiums. That will give me two oxygens. That will give me two hydrogens. So the total number of hydrogens over here are four, which is not balanced with the water over on the reactant side, but the only way I'm gonna be able to get it to balance is to make sure all the hydrogens on the reactant side end up being a total even number to balance with the water molecule. So if I balance this, notice that this messes everything up. <laughs> Don't worry about it. If you have to do this, then you can go back and rebalance things. So here, my sodium is now not balanced, two sodiums, one sodium, so I'm going to put a two here. So now I have two sodiums. Looking back, now I have two sodiums, two oxygens, one oxygen, so I'm going to have to have two water molecules. Let me do them in a different color so you can see. So now I'll have two times, wow, two times two times two giving me four hydrogens, giving me two oxygens. 
So now I have two sodiums. I didn't mess those up. I have two oxygens on both sides. I didn't mess those up. Those are good. And now I have four hydrogens on the reactant side. And if you look over on the product side, I have two hydrogens up here and I have two hydrogens down here. So I have four hydrogens total. So that's a one. I don't have to change the number of those hydrogens. If I didn't have to put anything here, that means that it was just one was needed in order for the balancing. So here's another one, this aluminum one with the parentheses. Remember with the parentheses, you're going to multiply everything inside by the number that is found outside. So 2Al3S12 oxygen. This looks huge, but it'll be all right. Two hydrogen, one oxygen. So there's just the list. Just make the list all in a row. Do the product side. One aluminum, three oxygen, three hydrogen, two more hydrogen, one sulfur, four oxygen. <coughs> First rule, balance the simpler ones. See, they've got oxygen over here and oxygen over here and hydrogen. Jeez. Don't balance those first. Balance your aluminums first, then balance your sulfurs, and then we'll deal with the rest of them. So the first one's aluminum. So with aluminum, I'm going to put a two here. Now everything in this molecule is multiplied times two. So just make sure you multiply everything that's in the formula. So two aluminums, six oxygens, and six hydrogens. Now I gotta balance sulfur. So sulfurs are found three on the reactant side, one on the product side. So I'm going to have to have three. So this will need to be a three. So that means all of this is multiplied by three. Six hydrogens, three sulfurs, 12 oxygens, geez. So aluminums are two and two, they're balanced. Sulfurs are three and three, they're balanced. Now, since oxygen is found in two places on both sides, leave them till last. So the next one I want you to balance is I want you to balance hydrogen. So on this side, I have a total of 12 hydrogen now. Six hydrogen in the first molecule, six hydrogen in the second molecule, so I have 12. So in order to have 12 hydrogen over here, I'm going to have to have six water molecules. So that means if I have that, let me change my color. So six is going to be times six times six. So now I have 12 hydrogens and six oxygens from the water. So hydrogens are now balanced. Aluminums are still balanced. Sulfurs are still balanced. So now I've got to count these oxygens. So over here I have 12 and six, that's 18. Over here I have six and 12, that's 18. So magic, the oxygens balance themselves, that is one. So don't worry if they start looking like they're getting bigger. Sometimes that's going to happen. Oftentimes they stay pretty simple. One last one, I'll let you work on these ones. And then, like I said, if you want more examples, uh, there'll be another video that's posted that you can use for review. Cl2, two chlorines, H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. In fact, a good thing to do if you think you've actually got this, pause the video, balance this, and then watch afterwards to see if you actually got it right. One hydrogen and one chlorine, O2, is two oxygen. So everything's just found in one place, so that's nice. <laughs> so chlorines and chlorines, not balanced. Hydrogens and hydrogens, not balanced. Oxygen and oxygen, not balanced. None of them are balanced. So just pick one. So I'm going to balance my chlorines first. So two chlorines in the reactant side, one chlorine on the product side. That means that I am going to have to increase the number of chlorine by increasing or doubling the HCl. So this is times two and this is times two. Two hydrogens and two chlorines. So now my chlorines are balanced and look, I balanced my hydrogens. Great, okay, so now this means the next thing I do is I'm going to balance the oxygens. 
Over here I have one, over here I have two, so I know that I'm going to have to have two water molecules. May make sure though, it's two H2O, so I have to multiply the hydrogens by two, and I have to multiply the oxygens by two. Rats. So what I did is I messed up my hydrogens. So I'm going to have to go back and fix this. So you don't have to start all over. I've just got to go back and fix this. In order to do that, I need to change the number of HCLs. So if now I have four hydrogens, this needs to be a four hydrogen total. So if I multiply it times two, I've really got to multiply it times two more. So just add that on. That's two more chlorines as well, giving me four hydrogens giving me four chlorines to balance my hydrogens. Oxygens are balanced, hydrogen balanced, but now look, now I've messed up my chlorines. Two chlorines and four chlorines means I'm going to have to go back and fix that. So increasing the smaller number, how many chlorines to make four? I have to have two chlorine molecules. And that'll give me four chlorines total. So four chlorines, four hydrogens both sides, two oxygens both sides. So this will be a four because two times two is four. So I ended up having to multiply it by four as a total number. That one just becomes the one. Go ahead and watch the other video if you feel like you need more help in going through and reviewing materials that we've done that involve math or practicing for chapter one.